نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه اما بعد فان افضل الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اخواني واخواتي نواصل باذن الله تعالى وفضله ما بدانا به منذ 3 4 5 6 اسابع وهو دروسنا في تعلم بعض الاحكام الفقهيه التي لا ينبغي للمسلم ان يجهلها We want to continue what we began concerning the ahkam in the issues of the fiqh of the ibadat and deal with some of the issues or many of the issues of fiqh that it is not acceptable for the Muslim man or the Muslim woman not to know about these issues. So we're bringing these things to your attention and we're trying to get a tafakkuh fi deen. We're trying to get some fiqh and understanding in these issues. so that we'll be in a better position to worship Allah Ta'ala in these everyday aspects of our lives as it relates to the ibadah. So today we're going to do an issue that many people don't necessarily have the proper fiqh in it and is extremely important, especially for those people who are married, but it is something that concerns all of us because on a weekly basis, even on a daily basis, many of us have to know what we're doing as it relates to this issue and that is the issue of some of the ahkam that are connected to al-ghusl some of the ahkam that are connected to al-ghusl the ghusl in the salah what is it how is it what are some of the hidden issues that many people don't know about we have not ceased to meet people who come into Islam and who have been in the religion of al-islam who are still making ghusl by taking a bath on friday or who after having had sexual relationships they get in the bathtub and they make a ghusl by just sitting in the bath water so these issues we want to bring to your attention in them most of us alhamdulillah because we have some years under our belt in al islam we know how to do it but for the most part there are some hidden issues that we would like to discuss as for the mashru'iyah of the ghusl or the legislation of the ghusl the fact that the ghusl has been legislated where's the dalil that there is a ghusl in al-islam and that is wajib this word this kalima this concept al-ghusl where does allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order us to make the ghusl in surah al-maida al-maida or the table spread the table cloth al-maida qala rabbukum subhanahu wa ta'ala wa in kuntum junuban fatahharu and if you are junub then make the tahar to purify yourself clean yourself this tahar here is the ghusl if you are junub and the janaba comes as a result of a man or a woman having sexual relationship or a man or a woman having a wet dream So Allah Ta'ala tells us that this is the hadith al-akbar this is the big hadith that you have to make a ghusl for and that's the first dalil another dalil is in surah al-baqarah in ayat number 226 qala Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala rabbuna wa rabbukum wa yas'alunaka 'an al-mahid qul huwa adhan fa'tazilu an-nisa fi al-mahid wa la taqrabuhunna hatta yatharna fa'idha tatahharna فأتوهن من حيث أمركم الله إن الله يحب التوابين ويحب المتطهرين and they ask you ya muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the woman's menses say unto them verily the woman's menses is a harm it is an adha it is an annoyance so don't have sexual relationships with her during that time they ask you about the woman's menses say unto them their menses is a hurt So stay away from the women as it relates to sex. Stay away from them and do not have relationships with them. It's a kabira from the kabair and it's wasqan. It's dirty and it's filthy and it's haram. 
So stay away from the women while they are in that state until they become pure. And when their menses stop and they purify themselves, then come to them as Allah has ordered you. Come to them and send something forth before you come to them. Come to them from the front or the back. Come to them in a way that is halal. Once they become pure and they clean themselves, then come to them as Allah has ordered you to come to them. Verily, Allah loves those people who are often repentant, and Allah Ta'ala loves those people who are clean. To have the sexual relationships with the women in their minces is not from a tahara, it is from a najasa. And we took the class about the najasat in Al Islam, and one of the najasat that we mentioned was the haid of the imra'a. That it is a hurt and is a filth. وَيَنْبَغِي لِلْمُسْلِمِ يَجْتَنِبُهُ The man who has some muru'a, the man who has some taqwa, the man who has some sense about his health and her health, the man who is above the level of the hayawanat, the animals, he does not come to his woman in that particular condition. But the man who's a dog and he's overcome with his shahwa, then he'll do whatever, he'll do anything. حَدِّثْ وَلَا حَرَجْ So that's another delil concerning the ghusl. That when the woman is on her menses, in order to purify herself and to prepare herself to have sexual relationships with her husband, or to fast, or to make salah, she has to make the ghusl. Another delil from the adilla is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa. قال الله سبحانه وتعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى حتى تعلموا ما تقولون ولا جنبا إلا عابر السبيل حتى تختسلوا Oh you who believe do not come to the prayer while you are in a state of drunkenness until you know what you're saying don't come to the prayer while you are high cracked out of your mind smoke some weed drunk some brew don't come to the salat while you're in the state that doesn't mean you have a green light here to get high and to delay the salah. It means that at that time when they were allowed to drink, the ruling was, okay, you people can drink, but don't come to the prayer while you're in the state of intoxication. So drink after Salat al-Isha so that you can sleep it off in the morning. Or drink after Fajr so that you'll be ready to make Salat al-Zuhr by the time that it comes around. But don't drink an hour before Salat al-Asr, an hour before Salat al-Maghrib during that time. So this hukum from the Qur'an has been mensukh and everyone knows that it has been abrogated, even the Bedouin in the desert. All you who believe, do not come to the prayer in a state of intoxication until you know what you are saying. And do not come to the prayer in the state of janaba. Don't come to the salah in the state of janaba while you are junub, except that you want to pass through. Inna abir as-sabil, hatta takhtasilu. If you want to come through, and you want to pass through the Salat or the Masjid, okay, now it's permissible in that state to come close to the Salat. But don't come to the Salat in order to pray. So, Ikhwan, those are some of the adilla from the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that show the obligation of making the ghusl. Now we come to this issue. And the issue is, what are the things that the person falls into or he does that makes it obligatory upon him to make the ghusl? Uktubu hada mujibat al ghusl. Ain al qalam ya akhi shafiq. Ain al qalam? You call this the mujibat. Mujibat al ghusl. Akhi, can you get some juraid that says the magic marker? You have one, Akhi Abdul Malik? Juraid has them. What's the eraser? The mujibat al ghusl from the word wajib. What are the things that a person can fall into, that a person does, that makes the ghusl wajib? There are a few things that we want to mention here, and inshallah we're going to have a second part to this class next week, bi'idni rabbi tabaraka wa ta'ala. The very first thing, ikhwan, that we want to mention today that makes it a, an obligation for you to make the ghusl is the khuruj of the minni bi shahwa. The khuruj of the minni bi shahwa. That a man emits semen. And the semen comes out as a result of shahwa, desire. You have to make that distinction, ya rahmatullah. If the semen comes out of a man because of his desire for sex, then it is wajib upon him to make the ghusl. That's if it comes out with the shahwa. And we talked in our class of the najasat that al-manni, is it najasa or not najasa? Who knows? Abdul Malik. Amenni. 
feeling. Is it Najasa or not Najasa? Naam, inti ahi. Shafiq. It's not Najasa. What's the delil that al many or semen is not Najasa? Aisha said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had relationships with her and he had some semen on his soul. And she used to just take her finger and she used to scrape it off after it had dried. If it was Najasa, she would have taken the water and wiped it off or washed it off. And we gave a lot of adilla to prove that al manni is not from the Najasa. So the first thing that if you fall into it, you have to make the ghusl is if semen comes out of the man and it comes out of the man as a result of his shahwa. Al-Dalil, the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, رضي الله عنه, that the Prophet said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, إنما الماء من الماء. إنما الماء من الماء. He said, verily water is for the water. يرحمك الله. Water is for the water. Or water is from the water. Whichever one you want to mention. It's that easy. <inaudible> For the brothers who are taking the Arabic class and we're on the level of calculus and trigonometry. Innama, <inaudible> we already told you was the Adat al Hafa. Innama al Mu'minuna Ikhwa. Innama al Mu'minuna Ladina Ida Zukir Allah Wajidat Kulubohum. Innama is the first word. Al Ma'u means water. Innama al Ma min al Ma. It's that easy. That's a hadith you can memorize. It means that the water is from the water. What's the meaning of this hadith? It means if the water comes out of you, which is the semen, the first water, or the ghusl is the first water. Verily, the ghusl is a result of the minni. The water is a result of the water. So if semen comes out of you, you have to make a ghusl. That's the meaning of the hadith. If semen comes out of you, then you have to have water, you have to make the ghusl. That's the meaning of this hadith. And we're going to further elaborate on this particular hadith. Bi ta'ala. Move back the ghusl. Move back the ghusl. Move back The things that make the ghusl right. The first thing is the khuruj of al-manni with al-shahwa. Al-manni or semen with the shahwa. The coming out of the semen with the shahwa and the first delil is the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu that's been collected by Imam Muslim. The next hadith in delil is the hadith of Umm Salama radiyallahu anha. Qalat ja'at Umm Sulaym ila al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqalat Ya Rasulallah, inna Allah la yastahi min al-haq fahal ala al-mar'a min ghuslin idha hiyah salamat فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم إذا رأت الماء متفق عليه Our mother, Umm Salama رضي الله عنها whose name is Hind, H-I-N-D She said that Umm Sulaim who was the mother of Anas ibn Malik She came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and she said O oh Messenger of Allah Verily Allah is not shy of the truth Does the woman have to make a ghusl if she has a wet dream? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes, if she sees that there is water, if she sees that she has emitted some kind of secretion. So that's the delil, that the woman also has many. But the many of the man and the many of the, wo- of the woman is different. Both of them are called many in Arabic. But the many of the man and the many of the woman is different in its texture. His is white. And it is ghalib, or strong, coarse, thick. And hers is asfar, or yellow. And it is light. His has some, what they call an arak habibat. Some little... You know, like grit, I think they call it. When you eat something and dirt is in it, it has grit in it. His has particles, like grit in it. Hers doesn't have it. So this proves what? That the woman also has a wet dream and the woman also has to have a ghusl if she has a wet dream because she also secretes what is called in Arabic this ma'a or this manni. So that's the second delil. The third and final delil to prove that you have to have a ghusl from the secretion of semen or what comes out as a result of sex or a wet dream 
is the hadith of Ali radiyallahu anhu that the Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or he says سَأَلْتُ النَّبِيَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَنَ الْمَذِي فَقَالَ مِنَ الْمَذِي الْوُبُوء وَمِنَ الْمَنِّي الْغُصُلُ This hadith has been collected by Imam Al-Tirmidhi. Ali said, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the medhi, which is that fluid that comes from the prostrate, and it is transparent. It is not semen. Semen is white. This thing is transparent. He said, I asked him about this, this thing used to come out of me. So I wanted to know what was the ruling. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, if this thing comes out, then you have to make wudu. And if semen comes out, then you have to make a ghusl. So all of those adilla ikhwan show that the ghusl is wajib. This is something that every man knows. But the adilla, these examples from the proofs are what you have to concentrate on. The hadith of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, the hadith of Umm Salama, and the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhu. What happened in each case is a proof that you have to make the ghusl if semen comes out. Now we have an issue and a question. And that issue is, if semen comes out of the man as a result of cold, the weather is cold or it's hot, or it comes out as a result of sickness, semen comes out but it doesn't come out as a result of his desire, does he have to make a ghusl then? If a man has, a, 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 he has semen that comes out, but it's not because of his desires, does he have to make a ghusl then? The answer is, kalla, he doesn't have to make ghusl. It is not obligatory upon him. And the proof of that is the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhu, that's been collected by Imam Ahmed. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا حَذَفْتَ فَاخْتَسِلْ مِنَ الْجَنَابَ وَإِذَا لَمْ تَكُنْ حَادِثًا فَلَا تَخْتَسِلْ He said, صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْهِ If you, ya raju, if you man, if you have sex, if you have relations, and the semen comes out, as a result of you having desires, then make the ghusl. But if it comes out, not as a result of you having desires, then you don't have to make ghusl. You should wash the place and you should make the wudu. Another question that the brothers are faced with. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَهِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ And Allah is not shy of the truth. What if a man is sleeping and he has a wet dream and he knows that he had a wet dream? But he doesn't find any semen. He knows he had a wet dream, but he doesn't find that there is any semen or any wetness. Does he have to make ghusl? The hadith of Umm Sulaim that we talked about before, when she asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Does a woman have a wet dream?" He said, "Yes, if she sees the water." This is a proof to show. If a man has a wet dream and he doesn't find any wetness or any semen, he doesn't have to make the wudu because the Prophet said to Umm Sulaim, إِذَا رَأَتَ الْمَا Yes, she has a wet dream. If she sees the water, she has to make the wudu. So if he doesn't see the water or he doesn't feel the water and there's no effect, then he doesn't have to make the wudu. And Allah Ta'ala knows that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was asked this question by some of his companions and this is a proof that it's important and it's a proof that we're faced with the question as well because what happened to them happens to us. He was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the man who finds some semen but he doesn't remember having a wet dream. What should he do? He wakes up and he finds that there is semen but he don't remember having a wet dream. The opposite of the first man. The first man is the one who knows he had a wet dream, but he doesn't find any semen. Does he have to make a ghusl? No, because he didn't see the water as the hadith of Umm Sulaim suggests. Now, he is a man who doesn't remember having a wet dream, but he finds some semen. The Prophet told that particular man, Yes, Tessin, he has to take a ghusl. Yerhamakullah. If he doesn't remember, but he finds the semen, he has to take a ghusl. And he was asked about the man who knew he had a wet dream, but he didn't find the semen. He said, that man, he doesn't have to make the ghusl. So the issue is clear. Now, it's based on the yaqeen of the issue. And that is one of the proofs. This issue is one of the reasons why they come up with that principle in Al-Islam. That everything in our religion is judged based upon knowledge. 
surety, al yaqeen If a man has wudu and he sits from Maghrib to Isha and he doesn't remember whether or not he passed when or he went to the bathroom. He has a feeling that he passed when, but he's not sure. Even if his feeling is more that he passed when, is strong that he passed when, if he can't remember the exact time and what happened, the actual incident, then he can remain in that state and make the salat with the same wudu because he has a surety that he made wudu, but he doesn't have a surety that he broke it. So you have to build your life upon the yaqeen, what you know about, and not build your life upon the wiswas and the doubt. The second mujib from the mujibat of the ghusl, the second thing that forces you to have the ghusl is the iltiqa al khitanain. When the two private parts meet each other, whether the man ejaculated or not, whether they finished their business or not, if the two private parts touch, khalaf, you have to make a wudu, a ghusl. Someone may say, yeah, that's hypothetical, that's not real. No, that's real. It happened with the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He got married. He was consummating his marriage. While he was consummating his marriage, the call of jihad was made, and the man got up and he went outside. He went to make jihad. He died, and he never completed his ghusl. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ghasaratu al-malaika." The angels gave him a ghusl, so he never finished his situation. A man is having a relationship. He gets a knock at the door. He gets a telephone call. Something pulls him away from the situation. His child, his child, something happens. So if the two private parts meet, by the mere meeting of the private parts, khalaf, you have to make a ghusl. What's the delil? First of all, the hadith. Uh, from the second mujib, from the mujibat of the ghusl, is the khalaf. Is the khalaf. Why is it Why is it al Because it is a Musanna and it's Mubaf Ilayhi. al comes from the word Laqa, Tamit. Tamit. al Khitanain. Al Khitan means circumcision. So it means if the two circumcised parts meet. So we get fit from this hadith and we understand what? That the man has a circumcision and the woman has a circumcision in Al-Islam. So the first delil to show that this is the case is the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. That is mutafaqun alayhi. The Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِذَا جَلَسَ بَيْنَ الشُعْبِهَا الْأَرْبَعَ ثُمَّ جَهَدَهَا فَقَدْ وَجَبَ الْغُصُلْ وَإِنْ لَمْ يُنْزَلْ He said if the man lays between her four limbs and he exerts the energy then the ghusl becomes wajib even if he didn't ejaculate even if it, nothing came out if the man sits or lays between her four limbs he assumes the position that a man assumes and he exerts energy he gets busy the ghusl becomes wajib even if he didn't have an ejaculation. Another proof is the hadith that's in Sahih Muslim. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Masul khitan al khitan, faqad wajib al ghusl. If the two circumcised limbs meet or touch, if the two circumcised organs touch, ghusl is wajib. And also, Ikhwan, we can use as a dalil the ayat from Surah Al-Ma'idah that I told you about, about the Jinaba, when Allah Ta'ala said, إِن كُنْتُمْ جُنُبًا فَالطَّهَّرُوا If you are junub, then purify yourself. Ikhwan, in the Arab language, and this is why Akhi Naji, and the rest of you brothers, Tahir, Amr, Sharif, Samir, Abdullah ibn Asin, Abdullah Hassan, you brothers have to come to the Arabic class. Because the Arabic class is going to help and assist you in understanding a lot of issues. It's the key to the whole thing. Allah said in the ayah, "In kuntum junuban fatsaharu." If you were junub, then purify yourself. Junub, the word janaba comes from junub. 
The Arabs have always understood that the word junub means that a man has sexual relationship with somebody. If you say, Ejnaba Fulan, min Fulana. So and so became junub from Fulana. They understand only one thing. Janaba means that you had sexual relationship with something, with someone. Something happened connected to sex. So since Allah Ta'ala used that ayat in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ جُنُبًا فَاتَّهَرُوا As soon as a man has sex, he's junub. As soon as they touch, he's junub. So that can be the third delil that you use to show if the two khitans meet, then it is wajib. Now we have to take a step back, akhi, to clarify something, and that is the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْمَاءُ مِنَ الْمَاءُ What does that mean, Akhi Abdul Hakim? إِنَّمَا الْمَاءُ مِنَ الْمَاءُ what does it mean? Now that the water comes from the water. The ghusl comes as a result of semen coming out. When this hadith is abrogated. In the beginning of Al-Islam, if a man had relationships with his woman or with his slave girl, if he touched her and they started to have relationships, if he didn't ejaculate, he didn't have to make the ghusl. That's why the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا الْمَا مِنَ الْمَا that you only have to use the ghusl if you have semen coming out. So if he had a relationship and he didn't finish his business, he didn't have to make the ghusl. But later on, that ruling was abrogated by the hadith that we just mentioned. So you have to remember that. إِنَّمَا الْمَاءُ مِنَ الْمَاءُ is a hadith that is abrogated. So on the test when you ask for an example of a hadith that has been abrogated, then this is the hadith that you bring. When you ask on the test, for an ayat of the Qur'an that has been abrogated, then you bring the ayat that we mentioned today. يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَقْرُبُوا الصَّلَاةُ وَأَنْتُمْ سُكَارًا حَتَّى تَعْلَمُوا مَا تَقُولُونَ Don't come to the prayer while you're intoxicated until you know what you're saying. So now with that being the case, we wanted to share this with you. If the person is going to be in a position to teach the people al-Islam and to teach the people about the ahkam of al-Islam and to talk about the religion, the person has to have some working knowledge about the science of al-Nasikh wal mansukh What abrogate? What was abrogated and what abrogated it from the Qur'an and the Sunnah? So we have many books that talk about the hadith that were abrogated and many books that talk about the hadith or the ayat. The first book that I want to share with you because it's going to come on the test is the book that is called al-Nasikh والمنسوخ من الحديث الناسخ والمنسوخ من الحديث أخي عبد المالك you remember that title it's easy go ahead what was it الناسخ والمنسوخ من الحديث the abrogated the thing that abrogated and what was abrogated from the hadith where the Sheikh Ibn Shaheen a tremendous scholar who died in the year 385 he just bring all of the hadith that you need to know that were abrogated and what abrogated it and the circumstances behind it. That's one of the famous books. Another famous book and probably the most famous one is the book called al itibar al itibar Ain't no color. So the first one was by Ibn Open that up for me. The next one is the book called Al Ikhtibar. Al Ikhtibar. Ibn Shaheen, he wrote the book Al Nasir Wal Mansur. Min Al Harif. Right? Ibn Shaheen. Al Nasir Wal Mansur. Min Al Harif. The second book is called Al-Ihtibar by Al-Imam Al-Hazri and this is the most famous book and he was most high power in terms of what he did and then we have the book Rasukh Al-Akhbar Fi Mansukh Al-Akhbar by Al-Imam Al-Ja'bari just call it Rasukh Al-Akhbar Rasukh Al-Akhbar Rasukh Al-Akhbar Fi Mansukh Al-Akhbar In the Mansukh of the Hadith That's by Al-Ja'bari Al-Ja'bari 
Jim, Jim, buddy. Okay? We could come back later on. We don't want to waste a lot of time on those three books. The scholar from the Companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the name of Ubay ibn Ka'b. Does anyone know what Ubay was famous for? Just one thing he was famous for. Anybody know? Salim. He was one of the reciters of the Quran. Ubay ibn Ka'b. Ubay is from the Ismu Tasqir. It's the small ad. Akhi Ukhay. Abi Ubay. Ubay ibn Ka'b. He was one of the people who the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Whoever wants to listen to the Qur'an, the way that it was revealed, pure and beautiful, then let him listen to the recitation of Ubay. When the Prophet ﷺ used to mess up in the prayer as he did one time, after finishing the Salah, he would turn around and say, Ubay, did you pray with us? He said, yes. He said, why didn't you correct me? Why didn't you open it up and read on it? He was the one that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to look for to rectify his recitation. Ubay ibn Ka'b قال رضي الله عنه إنما كان الماء من الماء رخصة أول الإسلام ثم نهي عنها He said verily the hadith إنما الماء من الماء This was a concession at the beginning of Al-Islam and then it was prevented At the beginning of Al-Islam a man can have sex with a woman and if he didn't finish off then he wouldn't have to make the ghusl so that's a clear proof that it was abrogated. And that hadith was collected by Imam Abu Dawood and Al-Tirmidhi and Imam Ahmed, Sheikh Nasir, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, wa radiyallahu ta'ala an ulama al-Muslimin wa immatihim. He said that it was an authentic asr about Ubay ibn Ka'am. The third thing, and this is very important, Ikhwan, because it is connected to our Nisa. And we have to do more and take more time out to sit down to educate our women. Ignorant mothers are going to make ignorant children. Ignorant mothers are going to create folder or confusion in the masjid. So a man has to look at the education of his wife as an investment for his child. The next mujib from the mujibat of the ghusl is al hayf wa what is al hayy and What is al What is al And what is Nisa's Ibn Ismail from Delaware. What is Nisa? The hayy is the mention. Spell it H A I D. Al hayy of the woman is her mention. And then Nisaj is her postnatal bleeding. The bleeding that happens after she gives birth to the baby. It is right upon a sister to make ghusl. So when our mother Aisha radiallahu anha was making hajj and the missus came, it meant she was locked out of the box. She thought she can't do all of the things that the pilgrims do, so she started crying. So the Prophet asked her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what makes you cry? She said, because my menses come. My menses is here. I can't pray. I can't do what the people do. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna hadha min sunnatillahi fi banati Adam. That's from the sunnah of Allah and the daughters of Adam, which means what? Every daughter of Adam has to deal with it unless she has a problem. So all of us are connected to some of the daughters of Adam in some shape, form, or fashion. So we have to make it our business to educate them in their business as it relates to the menses and the postnatal bleeding. These are issues that force and make it obligatory to make the ghusl. What's the dalil? The first proof is the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah. Qala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِذَا تَطَهَّرْنَا فَأْتُهُنَّ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَمَرَكُمُ اللَّهِ The ayat that we already met. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنَ الْمَهِيدِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذَنْ فَاعْتَدِلُوا النِّسَاةِ الْمَهِيدِ They ask you about the women's period, the menses. Say it is a hurt. It is filthy. So stay away from the women and their menses. Don't have sex with them. He said, and if they become pure, يَرْحَمَكَ اللَّهِ If they purify themselves, if they make the ghusl, then come to the women as Allah has ordered you to do so. 
Inna Allah yuhibbu tawwabim wa yuhibbu al-mutafahirin. Allah loves those who make toba and He loves those who purify themselves. That's the delil from the Quran that shows that the woman has to make a ghusl after her minsid. Another delil is what happened to Um Habiba, bintu Jahsh. Not Umu Habiba, our mother. Umu Habiba bintu Jahsh, radiyallahu anha. She came to the Prophet ﷺ complaining about her bleeding, her excessive bleeding. She wouldn't stop bleeding. What do I do, Ya Rasulullah, with this situation? He told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Um kasi qadra ma kanat, tahtisuki haydatuki tum akhtasiri. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, remain without praying, and count the days that you used to normally have your menses. And then after the days that you normally will have your menses, five, six days, then make a ghusl, and then you pray. So it says say that the woman, she bled, her menses was five days normally, six days, three days normally. Normally that was her menses. But suddenly something happened. She has a baby, and now her menses is irregular. 14 days, 20 days, 3 months. And I say to those brothers, the woman who has this mince is called al mustahaba. This is called mustahaba. There's nothing wrong with the woman as you're going to see. She can be a righteous woman, more righteous than the woman who doesn't have a mince at all. And you can always enjoy her all through in the month. But I'm going to say from experience, you brothers, if you're going to marry a sister and you know that she's mustahaba, you better think about it. So that it doesn't become a reason that you got a problem later on after the fact. It's not an easy situation to deal with from experience of what we know goes on. So if the sister suffers from an istihaba, somehow, some way, intelligently, Islamically, with hishman haya, she has to let the wali know so that the brother can be told about that. She wouldn't be a kind of woman who is silent about the fact that she has a bald head, for an example. No hair at all, she, does, she can't grow hair. She has to tell her brother. And she has to be the type of sister who has a tawakkul in Allah and a taqwa to say, Look, I'm going to marry a brother who wants me for who I am. This is who I am. Look, this is the deal. Don't be afraid. So if she suffers from istihada, she should make it known. In a way of haya and hishma and sharaf and karam. So, this woman, radiallahu anha, umu habiba bintu jahsh. She asked the Prophet ﷺ about her excessive bleeding. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa told her, Count the days that you normally have your period. Alright, before having a baby, it used to be four days. Now after having the baby, when your missus came back, it's 20 days, 19 days. No, go back to what it used to be. Six days, and after those six days, it's not your missus, it is istihaba. That's as it relates to the period, ikhwan, al hayd As for the nifaz, the nifas, or the postnatal bleeding, it is the same blood as the menses. But from the hikmah of Allah Ta'ala in His creation, Allah changes that very blood that He described in the Qur'an as filth and an annoyance. They ask you about the woman's menses, say it is a hurt. Allah calls it an adha, an annoyance, a hurt. Stay away from it in this state. From the wisdom of Allah and His quwa, His power, He takes that same blood. And he turns it into the nifaz. And what is it? It's really the blood of the menses. But because the woman is pregnant, that blood becomes nutrition for the child. While the child is in the stomach, he is nurtured by that stuff. When the child comes out, there's nothing else in there for that blood to benefit. So it comes out after the child comes out. So it's nifaz. Now that blood, when it comes out, it is an ezza, just like its origin, original state, the state of the menses. So she has to make a ghusl once it comes out. When it comes out and she comes off her nifaz, she has to make a ghusl. And this is the ijma of the scholars of Al-Islam as it has been articulated by Imam Ibn Mundir in his book Al-Awthat. Rahimahullahu tabarak wa ta'ala. Now, wallahi ikhwan, we want to challenge our sisters. Instead of sisters getting together in the masjid, one group of sisters is in the far corner over there doing hair with grease and combs in the masjid. The other ones, they in the other corner over there talking about who's going to marry their husbands or who ain't going to marry their husbands and why they all messed up. The other ones over there talking about 
these Gucci pants and this Gucci pocketbook. Instead of the sisters wasting their time with that kind of kalam, sisters need to start educating themselves so that they can produce a nice, box research little book about issues like this. It's something that concerns them, something that they know. Why the sisters of our community can't come up with some kind of idea in order to produce some scholastic effort like that? There's nothing in our religion, as you're going to see, inshallah, that says that the woman has to be jahila. She has to be ignorant. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ مَعَانِي الْأُمُورِ وَيُبْغَضُ سَبْسَافَهَا Allah loves those higher affairs that you people concern yourselves with. Educating yourselves and then putting something together to pass it out to the people. Hold up, Ashley Harris. We got to get through this. I told the brothers we had a lot of information to deal with today, inshallah. Now the question is, after we have taken this, that the Nifaz is the same as the Hayy. It's the same blood, so it gets the same hukum. The ghusul is wajib. And you brothers should go back and try to encourage your wives, hey, why don't you do something about educating yourself and then educating the Muslims. Stop being ignorant. Stop being troublemakers. Stop being time wasters. Now the question that presents itself as it relates to the istihaba is, if a woman suffers from this istihaba, a continuous blood flow, does she have to make the ghusl for every prayer? What does she do? When she want to make salat, she has a flow coming out of her. So we know the hukum for the ghusl, for the hayz is al ghusl. Does she have to make the ghusl for every salat? The hukum is no. She doesn't have to make the ghusl for every salat because of the hadith of Fatima bint al-Hubaysh. But pay attention to this point. Because it's a point of ikhtilaf. Fatima bint al-Hubaysh. She came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What does the word Fatima mean, Ahi Amin? He told you that the Imara, the Imara, being in charge, the Prophet said it was a ni'ma Fatima. It was a ni'ma murdi'a and a bit al Fatima. It was a good suckle and it was a terrible what? Weena. Fatima is the woman who takes her child off of her breast. She takes the child off of the breast. So the woman who has a child in Arabic after two years or whatever, she says, I'm going to take my child off of the suckling. When she takes her off, that's the woman who's called Fatima. And the child is called Maftoum. What is the child? What is Khadija? What's the meaning of Khadija? Khadija is the premature baby who didn't go the whole nine months. What is the meaning of the name Bilal? Bilal. Who is Bilal in the Arabic language? Khalil. He's the one who carries the water. Now, who is Ammar? What is Ammar? Ammar. One who lives a long time. Who is Abbas? Abbas. What is the name Abbas Mahir? The one who found consistently, excessively. All of those are things that the brothers learn from learning the Arabic language. Anyway, Fatima bintu Hubaysh Radiallahu anha, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she told him about her problem with bleeding. Does she have to make a ghusl? What's going on? What's the problem? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said about her excessive bleeding, her istihaba, la, inna zalika irqum, walakin da'i salat qadr al-ayam al-lati kunti tahidina, thumma khtasili wa salli. He said, as for this blood. He said, it's only a vessel, a vein that has been broken inside of you. Something done snapped up in there, and that blood is coming out because of the vein that broke. Not because it's your menses. It is not your menses. It's a vein. You're losing blood, ya amatullah, because some vein broke. So therefore, leave off your salah. Stop praying for the time that you normally have your menses. And then after that, you had it four days, five days. Even though this thing is going on 20 days, your message used to be five days. Okay. You go five days, and then after that, make the ghusl and then pray. Fatima is used to make a ghusl for every salah. Rabbi Allah anha. This woman, Fatima bint Hubaysh, she used to make a ghusl for every single salah. Authentic. So some people say, the woman who has a sihaba, she has to make the ghusl for every salah. The dalil is Fatima bintu Hubaysh. But we say, la. 
Nowhere in the hadith did the Prophet tell her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make the ghusl for every salah. Fatima bintu Hubaysh could have been one of those extremely, excessively clean women. We know when the woman is in this condition, she can become irritable. She doesn't want to be touched sometimes. We know what she goes through. Fatima bintu Hubaysh could have been the one who would say, I can't stand being in this condition. So she would make the ghusl for every salah. Now if something is wajib in the deen, it's got to be some dalil that has yaqeen. Can't be from just what someone did. The Prophet ordered us to make wudu. And the Quran ordered us to make wudu up into our elbows. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu used to make it up to this part. And he used to put the water inside of his eyes. So because he did that, we're going to say to the people, when you make wudu, you got to put it in your eyes, and you got to make it all the way up to your elbow. Just because he did it. Even if it is authentic. So we stop where the text tells us to stop and we say, رضي الله عن فاطمة بنت حبيش That hadith has been collected by Imam al-Bukhari Another question, Ikhwan If a woman has braids in her hair and she wants to wash the janaba she wants to take the ghusl of the janaba understand this and pay attention If the woman is married and she has braids in her hair. If she has sexual relationship, she doesn't have to take the braids out. But if she has braids in her hair, and she comes off of her minsit, or she comes off of her istihaba, her nifad, she comes off of her hayd, or her nifad, she, she has to take the braids out of her hair. If the woman is on her minsit, and she knows it's going to last seven days. Okay, that's the time, sister, where you can go and get your hair braided. Because for those seven days, you can keep it in your hair, no problem. But if the woman comes off of her menses, she should take the braids out of her hair and wash her hair. But from the janaba, because it's something that can be done every day, Islam makes it easy for her. Just like it would be difficult for her to make the ghusl for every salah. How's she going to make the ghusl for every salah? She's working in the nursery for the children. She's a Muslim girl and she suffers from istihaba. How is she going to make a ghusl for every salah? So understand this point concerning your wives and your daughters. And janaba, from sex, from wet dreams. If your wife has braids in her hair, she makes the ghusl and she takes the water and she throws three cups of water on her hair. Or she lets the water run in her hair and she does like this. She doesn't have to take the braids out. But if she is coming off of her menses, or she's coming off of the post, natal bleeding, she has to take the braids out of her hair when she makes the ghusl. And that's another delil that is not permissible for the sisters that have dreadlocks like the people of the book, the Rastafarian, permanent dreadlocks. Okay, what are you going to do when it's time to make your menses? When it's time to come off your menses or to take off, to come out of the, the nifat? The delil of these two distinctions, Ikhwan comes to us, in the hadith of Umm Salama radiallahu anhu anha who said, Ya Rasulullah, inni imra'atum ashuddu dhafari dhafar ra'ti fa anquduhu lil janaba qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la innama yakfiki an tuhufi ala ra'tiki thalafa hafiyatin thumma tafidina alayka al-ma thumma tafidina alayka al-ma fatatahareen Our mother Umm Salama radiallahu anha she gives us a description of how she used to be she said, Ya Rasulullah, I am a woman who I braid my hair. I tie braids in my hair very tightly. So we know that she used to have braids. May Allah Ta'ala have mercy and be pleased with her. She said, I used, to, I used to have braids. So I said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a woman who has tight braids in my hair. So when I'm making the ghusl for jinaba, should I take my braids out? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no. It is enough for you to take three handfuls of water and to pour it on your hair, in your scalp, and then to purify yourself. So she asked him, if I'm purifying myself from janaba, from sex, wet dream, something like that, do I have to take the braids out? Nah, just throw water on your hair. So that's the first delil. The second delil is what happened with our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. News came to her that Abdullah ibn Umar was telling the women, if you got braids in your hair, you got to take the braids out when you make a ghusl. From the Janaba, that news came to Aisha radiallahu anha. 
Check out Aisha makes the Amr bin Ma'roof and the Nahi and the Munkar. She wasn't afraid. She said, Rabbi Allah anha, Ajiban li Abdullah bin Umar. Ya'mur al-Nisa, idha khtasalna, ayyankadna ra'usahunna. Afala ya'muruhunna, yahlakna ra'usahunna. لقد كنت أنا أختسي ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إناء واحد ولا أزيد على أن أفرغ على الرأس ثلاثة إفراغات This hadith is in Sahih Muslim When she heard that news she said this is a strange thing from Abdullah ibn Umar what are you talking about That he orders the women when they make a ghusl to take the braids out of their hair Why don't he just order them to cut their hair all off She said verily I used to make a ghusl with the Prophet Sallallahu from one container me and him together from one container and I used to have braids in my hair and all I would do is throw three gulps or cups of water on my hair so this is a proof as we were telling the sisters the sister has a role to play in educating the community look at Umm Salama, look at Aisha we get so much benefit out of their marriage to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam we get benefit from them. They teach the people. They help the community. They're not liabilities on the community. Problems on the community. Problems on their husbands. So the sisters will take this as an opportunity to get some encouragement. To sit down and say, let's do something even if it's not for anyone other than the young girls of our community. Teach them some skills about how it is to be a mother. How it is to be a Muslim woman. How it is to take care of your hygiene and to be clean. So that is as it relates to the braids from the Janaba. As it relates to Khan to the braids and Al Hayb coming off of the minces. Aisha radiallahu anha told us in the long hadith that's inside of Bukhari that she was making Hajj and her minces came. And she had braids in her hair when her minces came. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from what he told her was Da'i umratiki wan khudi ra'saki. وَمْتَشَتِي وَأُهِلِّي بِحَجِّكِ He told her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, postpone and delay your umrah, now that your menses has come. And undo the hair, undo your braids and your hair and comb them out. And then come out of your ihram. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari rahimahu Allah ta'ala, the way he put this hadith, he said, the chapter of taking the braids out of your hair to make the ghusl for the so the Prophet ordered her sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when she came on her minstead when she got ready to come out of the minstead to make the ghusl and to take the braids out of her hair sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam another thing that we want to mention akhawati sisters in al-islam handmaidens of Allah and ikhwani is as you all know it is also from the etiquette for the sister to take some cotton, to take a rag with some perfume on it, and to go over the place of the minces, to get rid of the smell and the fragrance of the blood, even after the ghusl. This shows us the high state of purity in Al-Islam. The fourth mujib from the mujibat of Al-Ghusl, the fourth thing is Al-Mawt. Medical mawt. Al-Mawt. What is mawt, Akhi? Al-Mawt. What does it mean? Malak Al-Mawt. The angel of what? Death. Death makes the ghusl wajib. Wajib on who? Wajib upon the people who are living to give the ghusl to the dead person. Not wajib on the dead person to give a ghusl or to get a ghusl. How, what are you going to do? Khalaf. Intaha. Am. It's finished. It's wajib on us. And it's fardu kifaya. Some of us got to do it. We have to give them the ghusl. The dalil of that is when the man fell off his horse and he died as a result of that. This hadith is in Mustafiq Ali. The Prophet said about him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his companions, اِخْسِلُوهُ بِمَاءٍ وَسِدْرًا وَقَسْتُنُوهُ فِي فِي ثَوْبَيْنِ He said to them, wash this man. He ordered them, wash this man with water and siddr. That thing from the lotus tree. It gives a good smell. Which goes to show, a man if he makes a ghusl, he can use soap to make the ghusl. While he's bathing, but he should wash, wash the soap off. He said, wash that man with water and the lotus tree, scissors, and then wrap him up in two folds. 
So he ordered them to so was it. When his daughter died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ummu Atiyah and the rest of the women were washing her, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ikhtinaha Salasan, Aw Khamsan, Aw Aksar, Mindalik Bima'in was Siddhar. He said, Wash her three times or five times or more than that with water and Siddhar. So if you're washing the dead person, you should wash him and end on a odd number. In Allah witr wa yuhibbu witr. Allah is odd and Allah loves that which is odd. So you wash three times, five times, seven times, nine times, eleven times, depending on the need. But don't waste the water. Another side point is the person who gets killed, fi sabili la, and he's a shaheed. Whether or not he's a real shaheed or not, that affairs with Allah. That's on the inside, it's in the knowledge of the unseen. But as it relates to washing him, we do not wash them with any water. If a person gets killed, fi we should do what? As the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's fi nuhum fi dima'ihim. Wash them in their blood. Wrap them up and put them in the ground and make the janazah on them. Because they're going to raise up the umul qiyamah with that blood smelling like the nicest mist possible, possible. May Allah ta'ala open up a place where we can go make some jihad and really get down. No, nah, well, lie. So we can go make some jihad and really get down. Number five, Ikhwan, and this is the last one, inshallah. From the Mujibat al Ghusl is Al Kafir Ida Aslama. The disbeliever, if he comes into Al Islam, it's wajib for him to make the Ghusl. That's why. The kafir, he has to accept Islam. If he accepts Islam, he has to make a ghusl. The companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Qais ibn Asam, qal, Ataytu al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, muridu al-Islam, fa'amanani an akhtasal, bima'in wa sidrin. This hadith is in Abu Dawud and Tirmidhi, Shaykh Nasir said it was authentic. Qais ibn Asam said, I came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I wanted to accept Islam. So he ordered me to wash myself with water and siddha. To make a ghusl with water and siddha. He ordered me. The hadith of Uthama, Thumama ibn Uthal, who was tied up to the masjid. And we're going to give the khutbah about that this week, inshaAllah ta'ala. He was tied up in the masjid. He wanted to accept Islam. He went out and he made a ghusl and he came back and he accepted Islam. So it was something that they knew. If you accept Islam, then you have to make a ghusl. So it's obligatory when someone accepts the religion of Islam, not only do we teach them some of the things that we teach them, but we also order them, get home and make a ghusl and come back, inshallah, wash that kufr off of you. There's a hadith that he said, take the hair of kufr off of you. That hadith is not authentic. But because he does have hair under his arm, hair on his private part, he should and she should take the hair of kufr off of them because they didn't know. So we can't be people who are in Islam on the Dawah of Salafi al Mubarakah and we're not taking care of washing or drying or cutting this hair off of ourselves. That's what we want to present today, inshallah. Next Tuesday or next Wednesday, the Ibnillahi Ta'ala will do the other half of the Ahkam al Lati Tata'alluku bil Ghusl. But you guys have to go home, study this, get with it, because it's going to come on a test. Insha'Allah Ta'ala And we have the last test as well Which are the Arkan of As-Salah Okay, we're going to take Seven questions So the sisters have to hurry up and send their questions over right now Muhammad Amin was first And then Al-Akh Hassan And then Amin And then Al-Akh um, um, Shafiq And then Al-Akh Khalil And then Al-Harif Okay Yeah, that's that's another narration. Like I said, even in the one that I said, the narration I mentioned, it didn't. I didn't mention that she had made the salah herself. I just was telling you all that. I just read the part of the delil, but she used to tie herself. She used to. Make, no, no, no. She used to tie herself as well. And the Prophet didn't tell her to do that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he allowed it to happen. No. No. 
We're going to deal with that next week, inshallah, with an illustration. But we're going to tell you now because people need to know right now. So you do what? You make the bismillah. Make the bismillah. And then you wash your hands. After washing your hands, you wash your private parts. Now we got to stop right here and we got to say, okay, just like Ali said when he was wiping on his hook. 